All right. Um, so as Manuel said, my name is Pete Volbrecht, um, and I am an assistant professor at the um, Western Michigan University School of Medicine. Um, it's a whole lot more in that name than just that, but that's good enough. We just call ourselves WMed. Um, and you know, to start off with, this is this is what I want to talk about. And I apologize if I'm not making eye contact. I have two screens set up, so I can't actually see you guys right now. Um, and this, I figured it out. Um, so really, want to what I'm most interested in is is are we doing outreach correctly? And and then kind of the the other piece of that is is how do we know <laughs> that we're doing what we say we're doing, and and how do we know that we're doing this correctly? Um, let's go ahead and advance this slide. So, so basically my goals um, today are to kind of talk a little bit about just my path to, to where I am right now. Um, and then obviously discuss my program that, that we've built here at, at WMED, the Brain Explorers program. Um, talk about the mission and the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and then really focus as, as Spaniel suggested on, on the value of data. Um, how to collect it, how to use it, and that sort of thing. And, and as uh, Faneuil suggested, anytime you guys want to speak up, just, just interrupt. I'm happy to um, have you just unmute yourselves. I teach all the time um, at the medical school here, and I'm very used to this format, I think. I'm decent at it anyway. Um, so feel free to, to just unmute yourselves and chime in um, whenever you have a, a question. or. I can't, I, I don't use Zoom, we use Microsoft Teams, so it's slightly different. And I don't see the chat bar, um, unfortunately, but. Um, Pete, Pete, I'll keep an eye out for it. Yeah, if you don't mind doing that, that'd be great. Of course. Um, okay. So our first unmuted moment here is, is what career you had in mind when you were in high school. I'll share mine in a, in a, in a little bit, but I'm curious where you guys were at in high school. Medicine. I missed that. What was it? Medicine. Uh, oh, I medicine. said medicine. Okay. Yep, yeah. yep. Uh, we're getting Sarah saying architect, um, Selena saying pharmacy, Gabriela saying medicine. I want to say pilot, Priscilla saying astronomy, you know, um, anyway. <laughs> so it's kind of all over the map a little bit, right? Um, that's kind of my, that was my purpose with this question. And, and, and same here, um, you know, so a little bit about myself. I grew up um, in Michigan, which is, which is where I am still. Um, I grew up just outside Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, in Dexter, Michigan, home of the Dexter Dreadnoughts, which is a battleship, if you didn't know, because I had no idea uh, until that's what our mascot was. Um, and when I was in high school, my primary focus was football and hockey and um, maybe a little bit of English, because uh, one of my teachers pushed me pretty hard in English. And so that was interesting and, and engaging for me. Um, I really had no idea why I was going to college, if I am completely honest, which is a terrible thing to say, but I, I was going because that's what I was supposed to do. And um, I went to Hope College, which is in Holland, Michigan. So went from one side of the, the hand to the other, from the east side to the west side of, of the hand. Um, and there I was challenged in, in chemistry. And so I, I grew up with three older brothers and basically if it was hard, that was what was worth doing. And so um, I chose to, to pursue chemistry mostly because it was difficult um, and, and I found it interesting and ended up realizing about my senior year when I was taking physical chemistry that I really didn't like that part of the chemistry stuff and really liked the biochemistry, molecular biology side of things. Um, I was fortunate to have a couple of internships with Pfizer while I was a student at Hope. Um, and side note, network with everybody and communicate with everybody. I got this internship the first time because I was talking to my dental hygienist about what I wanted to do with my life. And um, I had applied for this internship and she just happened to know the head of all the labs at Pfizer in Michigan. Um, they had just turned me down and I got a call back like a week later 
after going to my dental hygienist and I'm pretty sure she put in a good word for me. Um, so talking to people is super important and networking with everybody that you can think of or even those that you don't think you should necessarily be. Um, after um, Hope, I went to Vanderbilt University down in Nashville. Um, I got my PhD in neuroscience there. And the main reason I went to Nashville was because, um, well, the main reason I went to get a PhD was because everybody at Pfizer was telling me basically the ceiling is higher. If you have a PhD, go get your PhD. Um, you can always take a master's and this, this is literally the advice that was given to me. You always take a master's and, you know, then you're still better off than those who have taken, a, you know, a bachelor's and you're, you're still doing really great work. Um, so basically it, that was their suggestion. And many of them actually suggested to just go apply to PhD programs and then get my master's instead so that I could raise my ceiling, but get it paid for. Um, so that was some interesting advice. But anyway, that's why I went there because I thought I was gonna do basically pharmaceutical research. Um, after Vanderbilt, it came full circle. I went back to the University of Michigan, um, did a postdoc in the pharmacology department there. And um, we'll just keep this trend. And I went back to Hope College after that and was a visiting assistant professor at Hope College. Um, I finally got out of this loop um, and went to Western Michigan um, University's uh, Homer Stryker School of Medicine, which is where I am now. And, um, you know, the, the, some really important things happened along this path, one of them being this transition from Hope to Vandy. Um, Hope was a small liberal arts college with a major teaching focus, and Vandy was a big research institution with a large research focus. And I realized that I got a lot of really good teaching um, when I was at Hope and not so much at Vandy. And um, that made me really decide that I wanted to teach and really started getting me thinking along those lines and away from the kind of the pharmaceutical world that I thought I was gonna be in um, and more along the lines of, um, of teaching. And again, a little side note, while I was at the University of Michigan, this po possibility of taking a job at, at Hope came up after I'd only been there for about a, uh, somewhere around six or nine months. Um, and I went to my PI and said, hey, this is like kind of my dream job. Can I, can I try for this? And she was really supportive. And so good mentors is really, really important. Um, and finding those is not always easy. So keep looking. Um, but you know, she, she basically said, go try it. It was a one-year position at the time. She said, go try it, see if you like it. If you don't, you're welcome back here. You know, it won't even look weird on your resume. Um, you'll only be, have been gone for a year and we'll just keep publishing stuff and it'll be fine. Um, so that was incredible to just be given that opportunity to just pursue something that I wanted to try because I really hadn't had a lot of teaching experience up to that point. Um, Long story short, I, I loved it and wanted to keep doing it. And that's why I'm, I am where I am uh, now. So at WMED, my primary focus is teaching. Um, so put together just some of my passions in a, in a pseudo, you know, cloud, word, word cloud thing. And teaching was clearly the biggest one for me. Um, and I wanted to really look at this and, and compare this to like, okay, what is my job actually? <laughs> um, and how, where do these things line up? And, you know, for me, I was able to knock a lot of my passions off this list or, or satisfy these passions with my teaching part of my job. Um, you know, my love of neuroscience, my love of uh, schizophrenia and mental health and learning and teaching and all these things. But there were a few things that I couldn't check off just from this teaching aspect. Um, one of them, surprisingly for me, was mentoring because I'm working with primarily, not primarily, only medical students and they all know what they want to do um, and, and I've never done it. And so that's been a little bit of a struggle for me in my current position is like, where do I, I like to, to be involved in other people's lives and in helping them figure things out. And so um, how do I do that? So I, I really wanted to look at these two pieces, scholarship and service, and, and could I fit my passions into, 
things that would allow me to also satisfy these ideas of scholarship and service. Um, if you notice, my bench work um, word is not real big and my research word is still pretty big. And so how do I, what can I do that's still research, still data driven, still engaging, but not necessarily bench work. And for me, um, that's where this Brain Explorers program kind of came from. Any questions up to this point? I, I'd love to chat with you guys more than just chat at you guys, but I've, so I've, you, yeah, so, go ahead. So you teach med students. Is, 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 that, is that one of your, uh, one of the things that you do? That is, that is basically my number one job description. Um, I, I teach medical students Neuro, and I teach medical neuroscience um, in, during their first year of, of med school. And I, I would be happy to chat with you about my current position, any, any of you. Um, I didn't know this type of job existed. It's kind of for those who really enjoy teaching and focusing on teaching a lot, it's kind of a unicorn job. Um, I teach my course for six weeks out of the year. And then I teach events in other people's courses um, throughout the year. That is my primary focus. So I am crazy, crazy, insanely busy for six weeks of the year. And then I am teaching in other people's courses and working to make my course the best possible thing it can be um, the rest of the year and then doing scholarship and, and uh, citizenship type stuff. So I would be happy to chat with people more about that position either at the end of today or um, or any other time. Um, so, so this Brain Explorers program really was aimed at a few different problems that we saw. Um, you know, one was kind of this decreasing trust in and access uh, to science within the general public. Um, and I think that's been kind of further highlighted in recent uh, history here. Um, we also recognized a need to basically provide better science opportunities to underrepresented and underserved populations. Um, so that obviously includes kind of um, many urban centers um, where we don't have as great of, of public schools, but also rural communities where we don't have as great of uh, ed educational opportunities as well. Um, and then finally, this lack of studies demonstrating like the actual effectiveness of science outreach. What is it that we're doing and is it actually doing what we're saying we're doing? Um, so much of this broader impacts part of say these NSF grants you know, people are just going out and doing stuff so that they can put it on there, but they're not really looking for best practices or looking for whether or not what they're doing is meaningful to those that they're supposed to be impacting. So, um, so those are some of the problems that we kind of saw. And I've got my little um, logic model at the end here so we can chat about that and you know, just we'll have FanDuel not look at it so that, you know, I don't get too much criticism, but <laughs> um, um, so the way we sought to address this problem was basically by creating and assessing neuroscience outreach um, and doing that by teaming with local schools. So this is just a picture of some of the students that I um, had worked with. So a couple of them are published. So uh, Tristan and Riley have both um, are, been on a couple of the publications that we've had, which is another fun thing to be able to do is in, and it helps them in their careers. Um, what do we need in order to do this? Well, we needed people. That was really honestly the biggest thing. Um, one of the uh, efforts that we were making is to do things as cheaply as possible um, so that we could do these things without having to need a lot of financial support from basically anybody. Um, so we needed a lot of people and then we needed some lessons. Um, we needed time to do this, which within um, the school curriculum is not always easy, right? So you need to be able to, to demonstrate to these teachers and principals and other people that like what you're suggesting is actually valuable to their students because they've got plenty of other stuff that they've got to fit in. Um, 
you need some space and, and you do need some funding for equipment or supplies or things like that. Um, so, so the current Brain Explorers program is, was built here at, at WMED, but uh, I would say that a lot of the stuff that started this off happened when I was at Hope College. Um, so while I was there, we, we created um, our, their first Brain Awareness Week in conjunction with kind of the National Brain Awareness Week, um, where we basically had one week crammed full of activities. It was really stressful for a week, but it was fine. We could get through it. And um, then we, this was completely volunteer based. Um, now at WMED, um, we have a course called Active Citizenship that all the med students are required to take. Um, and they basically can get placed at different sites um, that could be like a, a, a food pantry or something like that or I managed to get myself on that list with the Brain Explorers program so that they can sign up to go and do outreach with me um, at some of these local middle schools. So it's part of their um, active citizenship course, but it's also, um, we, we take volunteers as well, though if people are just interested and wanna do it, but med students have very little time. Um, and so having it built into the curriculum is really valuable. <clears throat> All right, so this has been in existence for, I guess, about, I guess, at some, in some iteration or, or another for about four years uh, now. And during our first year, we had a bunch of volunteers go out to K-12 classrooms. We had what uh, we called our Brain Day open house, so students came to us on campus. Um, this was while I was at Hope College. Um, we brought in a keynote speaker to come in and talk about things. And we really tried to, to heavily recruit from the public for, for an audience. So we really tried to reach out to the general public to bring them in. Um, and we were reasonably successful. This was basically, as you'll see on the next slide, the only metric that we had from this um, year, we reached about 500 um, community members. So we were pretty happy with that but we definitely saw some, some problems, which we'll talk about. Um, in the second year, we went to even more classrooms. Um, we had a set lesson plan this time, that was kind of important. Um, and we had IRB approval to actually evaluate our students and how they, or, or the, um, the students that we visited and, and how they did with the content. Um, we still had our Brain Day open house, we had a community keynote speaker, and this time we did that um, so the first year we had somebody come in who was a basic scientist talk about Alzheimer's, which we thought, you know, we'll get all these folks from um, retirement communities and things like that, that, that will be interested in this topic. And they were, they showed up. And then our basic scientist couldn't answer any of the clinical questions that they actually had and wanted it to have answered. And that was a little awkward for, for him and for them. Um, and so we wanted to get somebody who was more capable of engaging with that um, general public audience and having to think a little bit further ahead of like what kinds of questions are they going to be asking <laughs> about this topic. And so that one we had somebody who um, talked about neuroscience and law and that was pretty interesting um, and kind of how neuroscience is influencing law and the practice of law and things like that. Um, and as you can see, we reached a few more people in year two. In our third year, we kind of continued with this. Um, in this instance, we also started looking at um, the demographics of, our, of the students that we were reaching, because one of the things that we started really realizing was anecdotally, we were hitting very different student populations with our in-class visits compared to our brain day visits, our, our brain day open houses. Um, so we, we evaluated that and, and as you can see, we continued to reach more um, community members. We still had our um, keynote address that, that year as well with another kind of accessible topic. And, and then this past year, things kind of didn't work out quite the same way as we thought um, due to things being shut down in, in the spring. Um, but 
what we were hoping to do with uh, Brain Awareness Week was kind of evaluate socioeconomic status across the in-school and open house events more directly um, and see how that impacted attendance, but also um, attitudes towards science. And with the Brain Explorers program at WMED, we were hoping to basically develop um, a longitudinal outreach um, curriculum and, and, and carefully evaluate pluses and minuses or, or, or differences between like what I would argue is kind of the traditional outreach model of like, hey, I know about this thing. I'm going to go into your classroom and I'm going to tell you about it once and then I'm going to leave and then I'm going to say that I did a good thing, um, which is great. I think we need more of that too, but basically evaluating the difference between that versus say going into the same classroom with multiple visits um, and actually developing a, a relationship with those students and things like that. So um, we have the IRB approval to do that. Unfortunately, we didn't have the approval to continue to go into schools as they all shut down. And so um, we're hoping to continue that. And we're trying to kind of evaluate how to best do that in this virtual environment. So we're not allowed, obviously, in schools. West Michigan, actually, many of the schools are in person, but they're not allowing any visitors or anything like that right now. Um, so we're going to virtually join these classrooms, but it's like, okay, is this the same? Now we have to really carefully consider, is this the same thing as, as being in person? Are we forming those relationships in the same way and things like that? So one of the mission, in the mission of, of Brain Explorers is, is this idea of accessible outreach. Um, so providing both accessible and accessible outreach opportunities and um, so what did we do that was accessible uh, in year one, as it says, nothing. Um, that was a little rough. We, we counted the number of people that showed up to things and that was it. Um, year two, we did a little bit better and we'll, we'll look at some of this data in a second, but we basically were able to look at neuroscience content knowledge gains. Um, basically when we went in and said we were teaching them things, did we teach them things? Um, about as basic as you can get, but still really useful. Um, and then we also looked at kind of what effects this might be having on undergraduate students in their abilities for science communication. And then in year three, this is when we added in that demographics data um, bit that I think is really interesting in that European Journal of Neuroscience article um, and looked at effects on attitude towards science, um, things like that. And again, right now, this, these are the things we're trying to do with at WMED. We're, so we're looking at basically the effects that that doing this outreach has on medical students and their ability to communicate science and things like that and and how that how they perceive it and how they perceive it as being useful in their career um, long term and then again as i suggested this difference between longitudinal and, and single visit outreach events any questions i see no hands pete okay yet <laughs> Okay, so, so going to that year two, the first and probably most basic thing for us was like, do these students actually learn any of the things that we set out to teach them? Um, and so we've got a really simple assessment here, uh, pre-post. So what we did is we sent um, the same survey to them twice, once before we ever showed up in, in their classroom so that they didn't take it while we were sitting there or anything like that. Um, and then we sent them the same assessment and asked teachers to give that assessment to them more than a week later and less than two weeks later. So basically somewhere between one and two weeks um, later. So that we, again, weren't just sitting right there. So they didn't go like, oh, I just learned this and I should be able to remember it. And then this is important later when we do the attitudes towards science, like, oh, this Dr. Volbrecht guy is standing right here. Like, of course I love science, because I should. Um, so hopefully to, to try and separate ourselves from that assessment a little bit. Um, but even this really simple, do they learn the things? Um, so there were four questions that, that basically stood out to us because they didn't have significant improvements. And one of them was, 
this question number four, I actually forget the exact question, but it was a true false statement. And it was a really high performing question already. And turns out true false statements are really terrible at assessing basically anything um, because you got a 50 50 chance. And especially if it was something that they already did really well on, well, you know, you're not going to get any better than that. Um, these other ones, as we looked at our curriculum, um, you know, clearly they improved, but they weren't statistically um, improved. But what was what stood out to us was that these were the things on our, our assessment that we didn't have active learning associated with in the event. So we maybe talked about it, but we didn't have them do something that had them you know, thinking about what are these lobes of the brain? I don't remember the questions off the top of my head again, but but we didn't have them actively participating and engaging with that content. And so it wasn't as successful. Um, and then overall, this is just the overall pre versus post, they learned some things. And again, it's not shocking, but it's data that many people don't ever collect. <laughs> um, we also, as I suggested, looked at like, how does this affect the students that are actually doing the outreach? Um, and it, you know, to me, this was the biggest one was increased my interest in communicating with non scientists. So, you know, yes, they're all going to say that it helped them to explain concepts because they had to do it. And so now they're a little bit better at it, hopefully. Um, and their communication skills, hopefully, if we did a decent enough job training them, have gotten a little bit better. But this is the one that can hopefully make an impact longer term is that they actually have an increased interest in doing so. Um, they already probably had an interest because they signed up to do it in the first place. This was volunteer based. Um, and so we helped to increase that interest even further. Uh, we have a hand from Rosario. Yeah. I had a, a question just about this survey. Um, was this like a pre-validated survey or did you create your own survey for this? Um, so um, so this was something, let's see. So the, the content knowledge was not pre-validated. That was something that we put together. This survey um, was, I, I believe we pieced this from, I don't think we used the entire survey that another group had made, but we used a pre-validated content from those surveys. Okay, thanks. That's yeah because there's a whole body of um, like data sets with pre-validated um, tools that I sent you guys. It's on Slack if you haven't seen it yet. So you can use that as a reference point, build something new or completely use that completely. So yeah, there's existing resources. Yeah, and that's a really important thing. Um, and, and it goes well into kind of our year three stuff. So it's not right here with this, but it, with the attitudes towards science surveys that we gave. Um, we basically took a subset of questions out of a validated um, survey for that because we didn't want, basically, we didn't want to put a burden on the teachers in terms of the amount of time that they devoted to doing this. Um, so we picked out those questions that we felt most, that would capture what we were after um, without burdening them with a 30 minute survey or something. Um, so this was really interesting, um, again, I don't think anybody is surprised by this data, um, but what I think is surprising that is nobody has collected this data before. <laughs> um, and so I think that's why we were able to publish it um, and publish it where we did, which is, you know, if you have an open house, the people who show up are people who um, are, well, in this case, who are <laughs> largely white and we live in a um, an area where we have a much larger Hispanic population than is shown in this open house participants. It's, it's much closer to um, what you see in the school visit participants. We actually have an even larger uh, Hispanic population than, than what's represented there. Um, and so this was clearly biasing us already, right? Um, away from those people um, that we were saying we wanted to reach, which was those who are underserved and underrepresented in STEM. <laughs> um, and, and, and the next part is also those who are less interested in science. Um, so basically the, the European Journal of Neuroscience paper is, is hopefully making a strong argument that if those are your goals, we really ought to be doing more of these school visits and, and less of these big 
relatively, I don't want to say easy, but relatively convenient um, open house things where you get to talk to other people who already like what you have to say and you don't have to go real far. And a lot of times at bigger universities, somebody else is kind of organizing it and you just kind of have to show up um, and, and do something there. Um, Would you say this is uh, like science festivals? Yes. Category. Yeah. Okay. yeah, absolutely. So that would be, so, so I guess I couldn't explain a little bit about, so the open house literally is, it was free to everybody. Um, it was on a Saturday morning from like nine to noon, had booths set up throughout the science center where they could come and do different activities ranging from like painting a plaster brain to like playing with a robotic arm um, and stuff like this. So kind of stuff for everybody. Um, but there's a lot of barriers just associated with having it on campus on a Saturday, you know, and, and it, you're not getting the same group of people. Um, so where do we reach students that are less excited about science? Um, so their attitude score, um, this was again, a, a pre-validated survey. And, and if you look at it, I, I, our numbers are not great, right? Um, but we have an N of 105 for our in-school participants and 34 for our open house. And our, our open house participants' attitude scores are much higher. And, and again, it's not shocking. They sought out to come to this event. And so they probably wanted to know more about science and they already liked science. Um, and if we break that down by gender or um, by um, ethnicity, we don't see uh, any major things pop out, except that uh, we didn't have very diverse people showing up to our um, uh, open house event. And so we really didn't have large enough ends to, to get any data out of that. <laughs> um, but overall, the people who showed up to the open house were much more interested in science than those who did uh, came to the, who were participants in the in-school. <laughs> um, which kind of brings us to the next thing, which is that, you know, we demonstrate that we had a, um, a significant increase in attitudes um, in our post uh, event in school subjects. We didn't report our data here. It isn't significant statistically. Um, we didn't report it because we have this N of nine and, and it's not very high. <laughs> so we didn't feel like we could confidently say anything about those statistics. Um, but, you know, and this is a, a pretty small bump. And, and I think one of the arguments that can easily be made here is, is this a meaningful difference, right? And I think that's a really important thing to continue to consider. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to address with our longitudinal visits, as opposed to a single visit. Um, we still did our content assessment and, and luckily they learned something while they were um, with us for those in-school visits. Okay, question there. Uh, Pete, for the, I think the first data set you showed us, the post-test. So you did the post-test one to two weeks after the, um, you know, the intervention, right? Mm -hmm. sure that um, have you tried to do it beyond that like um, you know plus six months plus we four. haven't tried that and and the biggest the biggest hurdle there is um, when we were doing this as brain awareness week we didn't have those relationships with those teachers kind of in the same way um, one of the nice things with the WMED program is that we probably could do that um, we could send these surveys to this because right now we're working primarily with one teacher and she does all the seventh and all the eighth grade classrooms at one school. Um, and so we could probably follow up with them. The caveat to that, as with all of these types of longitudinal studies is, is it our impact <laughs> or is it um, just that they've had more science and other things? Um, we're actually in the process of, of um, setting stuff up with another school in the area that has similar demographics to the one we're already in. Um, right now we go to our seventh grade classrooms one time and our eighth grade classrooms repeated visits to try and to 
look at these two things with the next, with the addition of this new school, we're gonna basically swap those um, and have our seventh grade visits be the ones that we go multiple times and our eighth grade visit be a, a single visit. Um, with COVID, we're not visiting them this year. Unfortunately, we had it all set up and now it's not happening. Um, but that's one of our thoughts there, but it's really hard with any of these types of things. And if people have ideas and suggestions, I'd love to hear them because untangling this like longitudinal aspect of did we have these, I mean, you saw some of our goals, right? These big, big lofty goals or, or outcomes that you're shooting for um, of like, you know, improved interest in science among citizens and you know all these things it's like how do you determine that you had that impact as opposed to other things um and the control group is super important here um but getting access to those people is really hard um it's very hard to go to a school and be like hey we'd love to send your kids some surveys and not teach them anything and uh, they, they don't generally like that idea <laughs> um but it's, it's a really good question. Good points. So, That's uh, oh, oh sorry. go ahead. Um, you mentioned uh, the surveys, the pre and post surveys. You said that true or false are really bad like questions to have. What type of questions do you have in those surveys? Yeah, so the first year we did multiple choice questions, honestly, because they're really easy for them to take and they're really easy to evaluate on the back end. Um, with this year three stuff, um, so we had scores of zero, one, two, three, and four, and these were open-ended content questions. So we asked something, and this is what we've actually done most recently with our, our Brain Explorers group two, um, is ask something like, okay, if you touch something hot, why do you, why do you remove your hand <laughs> um, and explain, explain why you did, why you move your hand. Um, and so then we basically score those, we blind the responses and then have somebody score those zero, one, two, three, or four, um, basically saying like zero, you know, some, these are middle schoolers. So at least one of them said like your mom and you're like, well, great, uh, thanks. And, but you know, some of them basically on the level of content. And in some cases, it's not even just did they get it right? But what kind of language are they using? Are they using terms that they wouldn't have used before? Um, you know, are they talking about the hippocampus? Are they talking about afferent and efferent neurons and stuff like that, that you know they wouldn't have before? <laughs> um, because you have a pre and a post, so you can kind of uh, compare those. So, where do we go from here? So um, we're basically working on continuing to develop our, our Brain Explorers program. Um, one of the more recent things that we've done is creating a lesson plan template um, so that we can create can really consistent lesson plans that can hopefully be distributed easily um, to anybody that wants to use them. Um, we have our basically our second group of, of med students coming into our, our program now. And we're telling our first group, hey, you need to write these lesson plans. And within the next couple of weeks to months, um, our students coming in are going to take those lesson plans that have been created by the students who have been here for a year and they don't get to talk to them at all. And they have to run that lesson with just the lesson plan that's been given to them because that's what we're hoping that we can do is produce something that people can walk in, take this, and then go and do it themselves. Um, and so that's what we're gonna have them kind of test piloting uh, some of these lesson plans that they've created before we put them out there for, for the rest of the world. Um, then the biggest thing for us right now is basically continuing to create these lesson plans, um, get them in these nice templates so that we can distribute them to folks. Um, and then continue to reach out to some of the, the local schools, especially as we start to put together these virtual lessons that some of our students are working on right now. Um, as we start to produce those, we can reach out to more and more places. Um, we're still really keeping it local right now, um, trying to build that um, school community um, collaboration. Um, 
and then following up on some of those studies that I talked about. So um, longitudinal set of lessons. Um, and one of the important things here is that these meet um, NGSS standards. These are the um, science standards set, uh, I forget, national something science standards. I don't remember what the G is. Um, but basically, if you can point to what these, um, what your lessons link to, teachers and principals are much more likely and interested to let you into their classroom. <laughs> um, we're going to continue evaluating the effects on the medical students. So this has been IRB approved and we've collected some data, but we've got to collect some more um, and then collect, basically continue to assess the effectiveness of our outreach. Um, one of the things that I really think that brain explorers can do for the broader community is provide lessons that have been vetted, right? Um, we can do these lessons, we can demonstrate that they, there is knowledge gains being made. And if we can make it really simple, then it's basically like you're, you know, you've got your Yelp reviews or whatever, right? Like, here, here's this lesson, and it actually works. And here's how, you know, like, we, we can show them the data, like content gains in this and, and what are the key things that we're trying to teach in these different lessons. So that's kind of what that lesson plan template is, is aimed at as well. Um, so that's kind of our uh, future directions for the program. Um, this is, oh, these are just pictures of kids. This is my daughter, uh, one of my children, um, her first time ever holding a human brain. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and yeah, so they got to do cool stuff. There's a, a cat um, spinal cord, the whole thing dissected, which is a really, really wildly difficult dissection to do. And so that was kind of neat. Um, and then just some acknowledgements. So at Hope, I was working with um, Dr. Gall and Dr. Ifri Brown. They were fantastic. Um, and at WMED, I'm working with Dr. Porter Stransky in developing this program as well. And obviously, as I suggested before, all the volunteers that we've worked with in the past um, are really important. And um, here is my logic model. Um, as I suggested, the lack of understanding and appreciation of science was kind of the major problem um, that we were interested in trying to address. And our mission was to provide accessible and accessible science outreach. Um, inputs, people, equipment, funds for that equipment, um, and then some classrooms to go visit. The activities would be lesson plan development, um, outreach events, and then the research that we were able to conduct. Um, the outputs, you know, I would love to create this lesson plan database. We've had a couple of publications as, as were linked in the um, folder. We've now kind of done some outreach trainings. This is something that I think we could do better on and kind of expand on a little bit as we get a foothold in the community a, a bit more. Um, and we've presented some seminars. Um, we're working on developing like a whole set curricula, like, okay, you've got six days. This is, these are the lessons that we suggest you use. Um, you've got two days. These are the two lessons that we suggest you use kind of for different levels and different um, ages. Um, and then um, just the number of students that we're able to reach um, and you know, the, the output of, of content knowledge is another uh, output. Um, and then our outcomes, improved attitudes towards science in the general public and improved neuroscience content knowledge. Those are our big outputs to try and help with this problem of a lack of understanding and appreciation of science um, with our major Assumption being that our outreach events will have a really truly long term uh, impact on science attitudes, which we don't have a good measure of um, right now. I can easily come back to this. Um, that is going to touch on kind of data and why we care. Um, so for my job, scholarship is a really important part. And I don't know how many of you are, are planning or thinking about staying in academia. Um, but publications are, are a huge way for demonstrating that what you're doing has value and it's stupid to some extent, um, but it's also the reality. And um, so publications can demonstrate your scholarship and, and provide an acceptable via administrative uh, views 
reason for doing the work that you're doing. Um, it's also really important when you're trying to get people to give you money. Um, if you don't have data, then it's a lot harder to convince people that what you're doing is valuable. Um, and I would argue that you you want both qualitative and quantitative. So the anecdotal evidence, the stories, the the testimonials are are really valuable too. Um, so getting that kind of feedback from from participants is is good. And then probably the most important piece, the part bolded here, um, it helps you understand whether you're meeting the goals that you set. Because if you don't actually go back and evaluate and try and measure you don't actually know. <laughs> um, so you have to prove it. <laughs> I better have proof. Um, so these are some of the ideas that I had for, for discussion questions, but I'm happy to open it up to anything that you guys want to talk about really. But um, you know, I think some things that are important to consider is why sharing what you're doing with others is actually important um, to you, but also why is it important to them? Um, and how do you plan to share, you know, your what you're doing with others, particularly those who have influence over your career trajectory or your program development. Um, and then the last one is, do your outputs and outcomes actually confirm that you're making progress towards your mission or your goals? I think those are great questions, uh, Pete. Um, I'll let people now, so free for all, please feel free to ask questions. There are a couple, of, uh, there's one question in the chat which I'll ask briefly, but um, if there are any comments to Pete's slide, go right ahead. Um, I have a question about what you mean by qualitative data when you're assessing uh, uh, output. So, yeah, is, so this, is this more like feedback from uh, uh, the, uh, what, the participants? Yeah, so that's what I, in, in my case, that's what I would say is absolutely kind of this qualitative, you know, and, and you can still look at this, and I, I, it's one of the things that my colleague is much better at than I am, is, is evaluation of qualitative data, but you can actually do a, a, a really nice analysis of, okay, and it can look at, like, okay, how many times are they saying fun, educational, you know, like you can look for keywords within things and say, you know, see how often they're saying those types of things, but also it's really valuable to just be able to show um, a group like, okay, we had these people who said this was the greatest experience ever. And I really loved being able to hold a brain for the first time, or, you know, my kid, you know, didn't like science, but now, you know, love science. I, I, I wish I was getting those, but I'm not, uh, but you know, <laughs> like those kinds of things, you know, where it's like, wow, this, you know, you can see kind of on a more personal level, um, what kind of impact it's having. Mm. Yeah, so the question from the chat from Neba is curious to learn a little bit more about the position and, and particularly how you publish and how your work fits into the academic uh, structure. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so as I suggested, my position in in my mind is a unicorn job um, because I get to solely focus on teaching. Um, so others in my department and myself included do. Um, medical medical education research, but um, we're not, most of us are not doing bench work. I do have a lab and it's basically a side project interest thing as opposed to like, a, I must do this. Um, and so that's been really great. And honestly, when I got here, it was like, okay, what is my scholarship going to look like? And, and for me, I already had these interests in outreach. And so um, being able to build this program to fulfill some of these scholarship needs has been has been a great way for me to do that. And then it becomes, okay, what data can I collect that demonstrates scholarship that's meaningful to my current position? So I'm really interested in the outreach and what effect we're having on, say, middle schoolers and the general public. Other people in medical education are going to be less excited about that in terms of trying to convince them that they should have similar programs or things like that, which is why we have this bit about what impact is it having on our medical students. 
in terms of their ability to communicate science, be empathetic, understand the community, all of these types of things. And so that's where that part of the project came from, is to really pull out how is this, again, thinking about um, how do I plan to share what I'm doing with others who influence with influence over my career trajectory, right? Those are the types of publications where people in medical education, which is the field that I'm in, are going to say, oh, this is really neat um, and, and have more influence within that sphere and, and show demonstrate me as an expert within my field. Um, does that make sense? Does, I don't remember the whole question. I think I answered it. <laughs> I, I, think you, I think you did. And, and Eva, if you have additional uh, comments on that, feel free to drop it in. I wanted to ask uh, Pete, for the papers, right? So did you like, it, did you have foresight that you wanted to publish the paper or did you sort of along the way realize, oops, I need to be doing this? Tell us the timeline of things a little bit. Both. <laughs> so the first paper, um, it was much more of a like, oh, this would have been a, a, the first year, like, oh, we didn't do anything that we can actually publish. We didn't do anything that was um, easily tracked. Like I said, we didn't have really a super uniform lesson plan even going into all of these different classrooms. We were just kind of doing what all these other groups have done, uh, myself included in the past, where it's like, we're gonna go out to these groups and we're gonna tell them how cool science is and then we're gonna leave. Um, and we didn't even have, you know, really clear learning objectives or anything like that set up, um, which is why we decided we needed some assessment. And as we we're filling, you know, working on producing those assessments, we were all of a sudden like, wait a minute, if we're gonna do all this assessment, we're gonna have all this data, can we do something with it? Um, and so then we went and got our IRB approval um, and, and were able to actually do stuff with that. That was the first paper where we basically created a lesson plan and, and showed that it did something useful. Um, the second paper, as we were basically running these things, it really became apparent to us that we were hitting very different demographics um, between our, our open house and our in-class visits. And so that one was a much more purposeful, like this is the question that we have. This is, again, anecdotally, it was really clear to us, but we wanted to collect the data that proved it. Um, and, and so that one was much more, there was a lot more forethought for that particular mm -hmm. question and now going forward we're really trying to address do we have questions and what are those questions and can we address them so we're trying to be a little bit more deliberate now than we certainly were at the very beginning <laughs> and the keyword here you know the rb really is you're going to publish this data sort of in journals and so forth so for those of you who don't start freaking out too much oh my goodness i can't do anything if i don't have an rb if you, this is for internal purposes evaluation it's fine it's the minute when you try to publish it formally outside then yeah, and and I'll also note that most of this type of stuff falls within a, an exception because this is stuff that is being done kind of in the normal um, educational process. And so right. you can, it, it, when we started collecting demographic data, that became a different thing. But when you're, if you're just evaluating, did our stuff do something? Did they learn something? That will almost always be an exception. Um, I guess I shouldn't speak completely, uh, but and it's biology, absolutes don't exist, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I, would, I would argue that most of the time that's gonna be an exemption, but you still have to submit it and have them say that it's an exempt uh, study. Feel free to jump if anybody has any additional questions. I have lots of questions, but I will frame. I will ask another one then. Um, so Pete, in terms of um, funding, like, can you talk a little bit about that? How have you been able to do this? And yeah, so I've been pretty fortunate. So um, we started off by um, applying for a Society for Neuroscience grant um, via the Society for Neuroscience Michigan chapter. So we sub submitted a, a chapter grant um, which gave us a little bit more influence, I think, than submitting it as, as an individual. Um, 
and that gave us basically our seed money for for starting all of this stuff up um when we were at hope uh the desire to interact with the community and the college was really strong and so we were able to reach out to various departments and say um we would love some money we're going to go do this really cool thing and so we were able to get a lot of internal um funding for some of these things so um there were some cultural uh cultural affairs had something so we started applying for these cultural affair grants um and we would part of what we were trying to do is do kind of cross-disciplinary um seminars and and themes so like the neuroscience and law we pulled in the political science folks and you know the biology and chemistry folks and then we did a another one with art um, and neuroscience and pulled in the art department and so we were able to kind of um, make it more multidisciplinary that way and, and get funds from multiple departments and this cultural affairs um, group and then now at WMED we actually have a, a whole like the active citizenship program, we get money through that to do our stuff um, for each of our sites. And so that's a, a source of funding. We obviously got a little bit of money from um, SAI to get a few things um, that to start off with. So so my my introduction to SAI was responding to a tweet from Fanuel that said, like, what would you do if you had a hundred dollars right now or something like that? I don't remember exactly what it was. And I told him, I want to buy this particular thing. It would be great. And he was like, wow, what are you doing? Tell me more. And I, I did. And then he was like, how are you assessing that? And I was like, this is how we're assessing that. And he was like, wow, you're actually assessing it like crazy. Uh, so um yeah so that was my introduction to sai was basically me grubbing for money uh <laughs> but um but yeah so we've been able to do that and um we actually are just looking at submitting something to the dana foundation um they have a, a like fifteen hundred dollar grant that um that they're running in conjunction with brain awareness week stuff so it's a lot of little small pots of money here and there for this type of work in my experience um yeah. that's as as most of you know like the funding is really really challenging part and part of sai is to to provide that sort of safety net you know and the future at least my vision is to create this platform for experimentation you can try stuff not worry so much about funding just worry about making things accessible and accessible as pete beautifully said there. Um, two questions, one from me, one from Gabriella, who will finish us up. Um, mine is more of a comment. Just thinking about the publications, you know, another thing to think about in your logic model is the citations. Like you, you're doing a service by publishing this work. It's getting out there to people. You know, our fellows now are going to read this and they're going to be like, oh, look out, you did it this way. This is what you learned. So if I'm trying to do this, this is what I should do, right? So I don't know if you've thought about, have you been tracking these citations? Have people been emailing you? telling you, my God, Pete, that was an awesome paper. I've learned X, Y, and Z, and I'm doing Z, you know, whatever. I haven't gotten any of those emails. I would love it. <laughs> you, can just, you can make up a fake email and send that to me. That'd be great. I'd still make my day. Um, <laughs> but um, no, that's a really good idea to track those citations. And, and um, you know, I get the emails from like ResearchGate and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I haven't really been formally tracking that. One of the things I will say with the European Journal of Neuroscience um, paper. We we pushed pretty hard to get that in there, and our goal was really, we didn't want to talk to other science communicators. We really wanted to get this out there to people who were doing these outreach things, but not doing them maybe the best possible way and putting the most thought into them. And so we really wanted to reach a, like the neuroscience at large audience, not the neuroscience communicators. <laughs> right, right, right. I think it's, yeah, there's all these creative ways ways to get additional data, get additional insights. Uh, I think the publication is just a wonderful thing where people are not thinking about so much, but it's there as an entity. I look at these and people emailing me is like a metric I'm tracking, like, hey, people are reaching out, they, they found it useful. Like, oh, cool. Like, how did you find it useful, right? The qualitative things that Umi asked about earlier, the qualitative things just make, give you so much validation. Uh, so just to, to sort of wrap us up towards the end here, and hopefully you can put a positive spin to this, uh, Pete. Uh, Gabriela asks, you know, what challenges are you experiencing with COVID and how are you overcoming those? Maybe just put it in the context of um, challenges overall 
and how do you, uh, you know, what should be your strategy to overcome them? I think that'll be a nice wrap up. Yeah, so um, I've had a, a few. So in general, like professionally, we switched to completely in-person classes literally two weeks before my course was supposed to start. And as I said, you know, my life is not crazy. I, I am very happy with my job, but those six weeks are about the most stressful thing you can experience. And so switching to completely in-person, or I'm sorry, completely virtual um, and trying to learn how to do neuroanatomy and via Skype is very challenging um, and things like this. So, so that was probably the biggest struggle. Um, and one of the you know, greatest things that has come out of that is just a, an appreciation for, for the students and colleagues. I mean, we're all doing this and people, at least where I'm at, have been incredibly gracious about it all. Um, I think it's really changed pedagogically, so the fancy word for how do we teach, right? Like, I think people have really started to think about what are the important pieces? Like, why do, why do I wanna be in a room with students physically? Why is, why is that so important? And, you know, so I think it's really forced people to think like very differently about what the importance and value of what they do is. And, and so for us, it's, much for medical students in particular who are very good at learning information if you give it to them right you put it in front of them and they can they can memorize all the things um so it's much more about being able to figure out how to apply information um so that's been one really interesting thing there and i think that kind of applies also to the outreach stuff right like okay why why are we going out into these rooms and i think it is really challenging um to kind of form those personal connections virtually when you're visiting a room once. And it kind of, again, highlights what was already there um, suggesting that these one-off visits are not as personal as we like to think they are. When you're there and you're laughing and you're having a good time and kids are excited, it's like, it's easy to, to feel like, yeah, we connected with those students. But when you're virtual, it's a little harder to, to feel that way when you walk away from it. But I think that was always kind of the case. I, I think there's some something about being physically in the same room that does make it easier. But I also think that we can be more deliberate in how do we make those connections. And I think it does, again, highlight the importance of kind of meaningful connections by being there multiple times in our case um, so that we can actually get to know these kids because everything just takes longer online. That's, that's the... <laughs> um, but it's been fun with our with our med students as they've kind of started to develop some of these virtual lessons to go out we've we've test driven a couple of them now um and that's been kind of fun with with some of these middle schoolers and just seeing how they work and um so i guess the biggest positive for me is the that it's really highlighted for me and for many the difficulties associated with medical school and what we're doing and it's given faculty an appreciation for students and I think students an appreciation for faculty so I think I don't think that quite answers the question uh, in terms of SAI related stuff but just overall life wise I think that's the positives that I've pulled out of it. It's the, it's the other lessons right the uh, unintentional lessons you're learning as you all know my question in the logic model is what are the assumptions what are you assuming um, and, and I think along the way, you'll learn there's so many unintended effects that are, that are right there, you know, and so I think grab them and learn from them. Pete, this was great. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Email Pete if you want to follow up with some things. Uh, his papers are out there. So definitely, if you have questions about figure two, figure three, part two, you know, I'd love to do that with people and scare them. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> totally do that with Pete and ask him uh, those SEMs or SDs. And uh, I didn't do that today, Pete, as I, I was refraining myself so much. Um, but with that, um, let me uh, stop the recording. Um, okay.